It's a, a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Thomas Power uh, with us today. He's a research professor of economics at the University of Montana and studies the intersection of natural resources and legal economic vitality. Dr. Power received his PhD in economics from Princeton University. From 1968 to 2008, he taught in the economics department at the University of Montana. From 1978 to 2008, he served as chairman of the economics department. Uh, even as an Iron Ranger, I learned economics. I, maybe some of you prefer economics. but uh, In 2008, he retired from teaching and administration and now serves as a research professor and professor emeritus. He's the author of six books, a dozen and a half book chapters, and numerous articles and reports in the field of natural resource and regional economics and the relationship between the two fields. He's the author of the 2007 study, The Economic Role of Metal Mining in Minnesota, Past, Present, and Future. It's a great pleasure and an honor to have him, and please welcome Dr. Thomas Power. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, I think, almost. Uh, it's sort of dangerous to talk economics while people are eating. Uh, economics for a long time was known as the dismal science. My students thought it was the content of economics that was responsible, just the dreary mathematical number crunching aspect. But that name came primarily from the 19th century when economists, no matter how they looked at the future, uh, were predicting largely doom and gloom. Uh, so the doubts and mistrust that people have in economics began long ago uh, and continues with some enthusiasm today. Uh, before I actually start talking about uh, the relationship between mining, primarily metal mining, and local economic well-being, You'll see in the, in the title of the talk that I have the word costs. Uh, to an economist, that's not uh, surprising. In fact, uh, most economists would be very uh, suspicious of any discussion of economics that only focused on benefits and didn't deal with costs. Uh, but it's often the case that if someone begins talking about some of the costs associated with almost any important sector of the economy, people who work in that sector uh, tend to get upset because the discussion of costs seems to suggest that there's something wrong with that industry or the accomplishments within that industry or the contribution uh, to the nation from that industry is somehow sullied. Now, from an economist's point of view, that, that's just flat out wrong. There's costs. Economists are fond of saying there's no such thing as a free lunch. There's no such thing as pure benefits. So the analysis of costs is just a practical, hard-nosed economic exercise that every business firm goes through, or it wouldn't be able to stay in business. Uh, so let's, I'm going to have to be waving at uh, my my partner here, uh, just to establish the fact that I wasn't bored and bred, uh, or as I'll say, I was bred and buttered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I came from an iron and steel family. My father spent his entire life from when he was a teenager in Pittsburgh shoveling coke into blast furnaces to the life he created for my family, including myself, uh, in Milwaukee. And this building is very familiar to me because he spent his life uh, serving the foundries uh, in electric steel casting companies that relied on the iron ore coming from uh, this area, carried in the Great Lakes to, to Milwaukee. And we settled in Bayview on the shore of Lake Michigan where there was a series of, of uh, iron ore facilities. You can put up the next. Uh, the, 
the church and school that I attended to attended uh, were surrounded by uh, worker housing for the for the iron mill and for the first 18 years of my life I went to bed to the very soft shudder and thump transmitted through the ground from a drop forge company that was only three blocks from our house. Uh, so I have fond memories of uh, the role that uh, iron and steel played in uh, my family's life, in my community's life, and in the, in the nation's life. So being, being anti-mining or anti-metal mining to me uh, just makes absolutely no sense at all. Uh, and talking about costs, just as, and I'll keep repeating this, just as the mining companies focus on costs, the public uh, and public decision makers need to be focused on costs as well as benefits too. Otherwise, no hard-nosed, eyes wide open, practical decision can be made. Next slide. Uh, of course, most of the people associated with and I better start. Uh, most people associated with, with metal mining uh, scratch their heads when, 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 when people begin worrying about whether we really should proceed with the development of a new ore deposit. Uh, the impression you get is uh, that's just nuts to be worried about it. There shouldn't be any controversy about it because all of us should know from our experience uh, here in, in uh, Minnesota or in the Upper Peninsula or in Western Montana or elsewhere across the United States of the huge promise associated with developing new mines. Uh, those mines pay uh, almost the highest uh, pay of any blue collar job you can find in the United States. Uh, significant high pay associated with the jobs, tremendous amounts of wealth are extracted from the earth. And Butte, Montana, just upstream from Missoula where I live, the uh, hill that was mined and ultimately turned into an open, open pit mine, the Berkeley Pit, that hill was called the richest hill on earth because of the wealth that was created in the late 19th and early 20th century. So, a significant wealth produced, very high paid jobs, new income for households, new income for governments. Uh, the benefits are obvious. Uh, there's, there's no one that, that I know that doubts that those benefits are real. But the question is, uh, is there really a free lunch here? Is this the unusual economic activity in which the benefits are so spectacular and the costs so trivial that we don't have to engage in business-like calculations or business-like evaluation uh, about mining. Economic impact analysis, which is uh, typically sponsored by uh, the advocates of a new mine, uh, is a pure benefits analysis that asks how many jobs will be created? What will the payroll be? What taxes will be paid? What's the dollar value of the wealth that will be extracted from the earth? They go through a long list of the benefits, but it's not really economic impact analysis in the sense that it's pure benefits. It's free lunch economics. It's unbusinesslike economics because the cost side of the equation uh, is ignored. Next slide. Uh, any, and I, I've already said this, uh, any real economic analysis uh, has to uh, weigh benefits against costs. That's what economic choice is all about. That's what looking at trade-offs is all about. That's what uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, skill and and business analysis is all about, is that sort of careful weighing of, of uh, the pluses and the minuses, where you only proceed uh, if there's net benefits involved. Uh, I want to emphasize again, and this is going to be sort of a theme, that 
no mining company could stay in business if they didn't look at the benefits and costs. When they, the geologist come and says, we have this huge deposit of copper ore, the, the mining company doesn't just imagine how valuable that copper ore would be if it were extracted from the ground, uh, concentrated, smelted, refined, and now loaded as pure copper onto a railroad car and say, this is spectacular. They have to look at the cost associated with each step of that to know whether it makes sense or not. And in most cases, uh, it's often the case that the mining companies simply walk away with very lar from very large deposits of ore simply because the benefits won't uh, justify the costs. Uh, one of the important points here is that the public should engage in the same business-like analysis of benefits and costs and ask the question, will there be, is it likely there will be net benefits? We have to be the same sort, engage in the same sort of hard-nosed business uh, analysis. Next one. Uh, I'm, I'm mentioning costs over and over again. Uh, so somebody might say, well, why do you believe there's significant costs or that the costs might be quite high? Well, I spent 45 years uh, in the uh, western United States, but studying, and couldn't do that, especially in Montana, without studying the copper industry uh, or studying next door in, in uh, Silver Valley of Idaho, the silver industry, or going east, the silver industry of South Dakota, uh, or going uh, uh, south to the uranium in Wyoming, the coal in Wyoming, the copper in, in Utah, the copper in uh, uh, Arizona and, and New Mexico. Uh, I've been studying because I had to study mining in Montana because it was such a big part of the economy. I ended up stu studying mining uh, throughout the West around the United States and around the world. Uh, if we just look at our past, we certainly get plenty of indications that there are substantial costs associated with mining, that mining does not always bring prosperity, or it doesn't always or even usually bring sustained prosperity. Uh, that's based on empirical review of what's actually happened in mining communities. Uh, and one can just think back over uh, some of the areas of persistent poverty in the United States that generations of national leaders have tried to wrestle with. Appalachia is our oldest mining area in the United States. It's also has been a region of persistent poverty even now, as that coal mining continues, we have centuries of mining, centuries of high-paid jobs, centuries of incredibly valuable coal, the coal that allowed us to engage in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and yet, the source of that coal is an area of persistent poverty. But that also, at times, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan has been labeled by the federal government in area of persistent poverty because of the collapse of the metal mining industry uh, in that region. Uh, the, the copper towns of Arizona or New Mexico or Four Corners, uh, the Ozarks, many of our historic mining areas are also areas of persistent poverty with low wages, high poverty levels, high unemployment levels, uh, irregular income, uh, etc. One needs to understand how that can be. Next slide. Uh, that puzzle actually is what got me involved in the studying of mining. I was sitting in Montana, studying the Montana economy, and just a hundred miles away from Missoula and the university uh, was Butte and Anaconda, Montana which were not known uh, for decades and decades and decades as prosperous cities. They were known as cities 
that were teetering on the edge of becoming ghost towns. Even as the mines operated, even as the smelter operated. And it, it, it led me to talk in terms and puzzle over, scratch my head over what, what I've labeled the economic anomaly of, of mining, despite the promise that all of us know of the high wages, the high revenues paid to governments. We, we like to tax out-of-state corporations so we don't have to tax ourselves. So substantial revenues do flow from mining. Uh, high wages, tremendous wealth, but the outcome uh, often, uh, uh, one could almost say usually, is relatively depressed, run-down towns and regions uh, uh, and the problems of, of economic distress that, that I've already mentioned. Next slide. Uh, that led me to uh, write several things, and I just have two of them mentioned here. One was uh, a chapter uh, published by the uh, New Mexico Tech, associated with the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources, uh, uh, five years, well, no, seven, eight years ago now, uh, and was the basis of a, a book entitled Lost Landscapes and Failed Economies that was published back in, in 1996. Uh, the next one. The question is, how can it be? I mean, that's the anomaly. How, we know the wealth is there. We know the high wages are there. Uh, how could prosperity not uh, get dispersed through the, through the regional economy? I'm going to quickly run through a long list, and we aren't going to have the time to, to talk about uh, all of them. Uh, uh, but I will try and emphasize those that I think, think are most important. Uh, what, are the what are the problems associated with mining? Why, why does prosperity not always follow mining? One of the problems is the instability of the jobs and the income. Uh, people are used to the phrase boom bust, where a, a town comes out of, shows up and is developed out of nothing, and when the mine closes, uh, it becomes a ghost town, and that's the end of it. Uh, but it's not, although there is that boom bust, come and go aspect of, of mining, uh, most of the instability is what economists have come to labor flicker, where the mines don't shut down. As the price of copper, for instance, fluctuates, the profitability of mining <clears throat> and particular mines fluctuates too. Uh, some mines have to shut down. Other mines simply turn and focus on the highest quality ore, uh, leaving the lower grade ore until the price of copper comes back up. So that the, as the price of copper fluctuates, the level of employment and payroll and taxes paid to local governments fluctuates too. And we'll see some detail on that in a, in a minute. Mining is also one of the oldest industries that, that has, has been around. Uh, and we've gotten better and better and better at developing technologies that reduce uh, the amount of labor that's necessary to pursue that, uh, that mineral or that metal. Uh, we went from people with uh, burrows and picks and shovels uh, following veins of metal into the mountain to uh, block rooms and pillars uh, moving very large equipment underground uh, as, as we reach lower and lower grade ores, to big, huge open pits using even more gargantuan uh, machinery, uh, to back to mining under what's under the open pits uh, to get the last of the ore with uh, almost entirely uh, automated uh, uh, technology. So as time has passed, the amount of labor we need uh, uh, to produce those metals uh, has continuously declined. That leads to on, even if the mining is proceeding at a steady level of output, the employment associated with that mining is steadily declining, leaving miners without jobs who stick around because there aren't jobs like that to be had in other industries, hoping that they will get hired back. Uh, mining is landscape intensive. Uh, it, it's especially these days going after very low grade ore, 
half of 1%, for instance. Huge amounts of earth have to be moved to get a very small amount of, of uh, uh, metal value. That's not just an aesthetic or an environmental problem. That's an economic problem, too. Those damaged landscapes aren't easily used for other purposes, uh, for other economic activ activities. Those damaged landscapes don't easily support ongoing human habitation. Uh, they tend to uh, uh, discourage people and businesses from locating there, and for that reason, it's a serious economic problem. Uh, often mining takes place in rural areas. There's limited capacity of those rural areas to support uh, the mine. Uh, they aren't going to be manufacturing the big earth-moving equipment in the local economy. They aren't going to be manufacturing the explosives in the local economy. Uh, the, most of the uh, value associated with the mining activity tends to quickly leak out of the local area uh, so that the, the wealth and the impact of the wealth that's being produced, even the impact of the wages being produced, uh, uh, largely impacts a much larger uh, regional area rather than the local area. Uh, all economic activities can't take place at the same point at the same time. Uh, some economic activities are not compatible with others. Uh, the creation of a large open pit mine uh, probably is not compatible uh, with a picnic site. Uh, it probably isn't compatible with hiking uh, or, or uh, floating rivers uh, uh, or, or other recreationally oriented activities. Uh, one of the problems with mining, partly as a result of one of its benefits, the high wages, is that it tends to displace other economic activities and slows the ongoing development of the local economy because mining comes to dominate the whole economy. And that discourages, uh, in a very measurable way, the development of a more diverse uh, set of economic activities, stifles uh, economic development. Ultimately, of course, uh, mining uh, exhausts the economic uh, potential of that particular mineral deposit, and the mining ends. Uh, as a result of mining increasingly having to invest terrific amounts of money in the preparation for mining. Uh, just, the, just getting ready to mine uh, can involve hundreds of millions of dollars of construction and engineering work. Uh, after that, the investors want to get their money out as quickly as they can. So the life of mines, the life of modern mines, has tended to get shorter and shorter. They're still mining copper and butte. The smelter doesn't, isn't operating, but they're still mining terrific amounts of copper in Butte uh, and have been doing so uh, for close to a century and a half. On the other hand, the Flambeau mine, uh, just southeast of here, uh, operated for four years. The proposed co copperwood mine up in jo Gojibic uh, County on the shores of, of Lake Superior expects to have a life of 13 years. Uh, so the, the, the period, the pulse of high pay, uh, the pulse of revenues, etc., cetera, uh, is uh, uh, spread over a shorter period of time. Next one, please. OK, squiggly lines. My students hate this. Uh, I'm going to focus on two, the first two things I mentioned about that brings some instability and uncertainty about employment. The first is the fluctuation in the price of copper. Uh, and I'm uh, focusing on copper here. Uh, and in particular, uh, I'm focusing back in 1974, 75, when copper prices reached a peak. You can tell my age by how nicely I can make that dot shimmer. Uh, the line here is drawn at that peak. Uh, uh, one of the reasons for drawing it at that level is to remind us that the copper prices we've seen recently, when adjusted for inflation, uh, aren't all that unusually high. 
Uh, this was the last time back in the mid 70s when copper companies, copper mining companies were interested in uh, uh, engaging in developing uh, the copper ore deposits, sulfide copper ore deposits that have been known to exist uh, since the late 19th century. Uh, Minnesota got ready to mine copper back in this time period. The legislature put up what in today's terms would be $3 million, a multi-volume study, almost 50 different studies were carried out to help Minnesota plan for copper mining. If it had planned and started copper mining in this period, Minnesota would have been in for a double shock because just as iron mining was about to collapse, the price of copper was about to fall down too, shutting down the copper industry across most of the United States. So if Minnesota had jumped into copper mining at this point, it would have experienced the double whammy of both the collapse of the iron industry and the copper industry. The other reason for looking at this is that, uh, strangely enough, every time prices are high, something strange happens. Uh, they tumble down, they rise again, they tumble down. They can even rise for an extended period of time and tumble down. Rise again and tumble, tumble, tumble. Rise again and tumble. What the really optimistic views of copper mining right now are focused on is these high prices. And the assumption, despite this history, the assumption that these high prices will last forever and that Minnesota will never again experience something like this. Even though they experienced it, the last of it, uh, only about a decade ago. Instability, high wages, uh, high value of output, high revenues to governments, but unstable depending on the what happens to the price of copper. That instability has to be taken into account. Just as a practice, the business community, the miners are certainly taking it into account. Uh, the public, public decision makers, the citizenry ought to be taking it into account too. Next, please. Uh, the other, the other uh, economic consideration that I emphasized earlier was the role of technological change. This is a very busy, cluttered uh, thing, but let me start by, by looking at just the productivity of workers down in the, the lower left. In 1974, it took 35 workers to produce 1,000 tons of, of copper. In 2003, it took seven workers to produce that same amount of copper. Copper production, this is looking across at the co Arizona copper industry because I've done a lot of work there and working on that issue now. Uh, the level of copper production was about the same across this period, but the total level of employment tumbled and tumbled and has picked up a little bit tumbling, uh, tumbling again. The total employment in Arizona in copper fell from 28,000 jobs to just under 6,000 jobs. Uh, workers were five times more productive. The workforce was cut to a fifth of what it previously had been. Uh, this phenomena and the impact it has on the community is something that has to be taken into account if one's looking 50 years into the future, or 30 years into the future, one should not be projecting constant levels of employment, both because of the instability of that employment and because of the role of technological change. Next. Uh, this is just looking at the outside of Arizona. It wasn't that there was something in the water in Arizona uh, that was uh, causing people to get laid off. Uh, the same thing was happening across the United States with uh, uh, employment, uh, almost 80% of copper employment disappearing between 1972 
and 2002. And then a very, very modest recovery uh, uh, since then. Next. This is looking at metal mining employment in Minnesota, uh, going from the, the peak in the late 1970s, uh, when there was almost 16,000 jobs, uh, tumbling down, losing 78% of those jobs, losing 12,000 of those jobs. Uh, whether this bounce back up is real or not, uh, uh, I don't know because I, the federal government stopped in the year 2000, stopped reporting on metal mining employment uh, and put more emphasis because employment overall in the United States economy, the role as a source of employment of metal mining in the overall economy had shrunk so much and so many other sectors had grown so much they wanted to put more of their emphasis on, on uh, new growing, growing sectors, uh, including oil and gas exploration and development. So they stopped reporting on metal mining. And I was estimating the metal mining over here on the basis of the statistical relationship between all mining jobs in, in uh, Minnesota and metal mining jobs up to 2000. So uh, that may not be correct, this uptick Next slide. And the reason I have that suspicion is that if one focuses instead on St. Louis County, one sees the same uh, collapse from, from 12,000 jobs in, in all of mining. So this includes sand and gravel mining or potash mining or uh, uh, whatever, what little oil and gas uh, developments going on, uh, but tumbling down tumbling down some more and not recovering very much. Three quarters of the jobs uh, in 2008, 2009, three quarters of the jobs that had existed in the late 1970s uh, had disappeared. Next slide. This is just, this is an attempt to put those job losses into some sort of context by looking at total employment, all jobs, in both Minnesota and St. Louis County. And of, of course, we can't look at those uh, side by side without changing the axis. So St. Louis County employment's over here, uh, and Minnesota jobs are being measured here. Otherwise, St. Louis would just be a little uh, curve that you couldn't see very much uh, from uh, down, down along the bottom. But one can see the impact on all St. Louis County jobs as a result of the collapse of, of uh, metal mining jobs in, in, the, in St. Louis County. Uh, the, this, this decline here in, in St. Louis County represents the loss of about 17,000 jobs. Uh, 12,000 of the mining jobs, the others in, in other industries that uh, directly or indirectly were associated with, uh, whoops, uh, associated with mining. This is the impact on the state economy. It looks like a much uh, 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 smaller impact uh, but that represents a loss of 29,000 jobs uh, in, in the Minnesota economy as a result of the collapse of iron ore mining. An interesting thing, and one of the reasons for putting this up, is how quickly both St. Louis County recovered and how quickly the Minnesota economy covered, recovered. It definitely had an impact overall in St. Louis County and, and in the state. But then the counties re returned without a substantial mining industry to a fairly significant growth rate. So that uh, going forward, St. Louis County, after the recovery from the collapse, St. Louis County added 228,000 jobs up until the Great Recession hit and things turned down slightly. 
in Minnesota after taking that hit of losing 29,000 jobs as a result of the collapse of the mining industry, Minnesota went on to add 1.3 million jobs. I emphasize that because it indicates that there are sources of economic vitality in the Minnesota economy, in the St. Louis County economy. There are sources of economic vitality that have been adding hundreds of thousands of jobs in the county and millions of jobs in the state. Uh, mining is not dictating the history or the future of St. Louis County or the state of Minnesota. There's substantial economic forces afoot unrelated to mining that have been creating huge numbers of jobs. Uh, and I think it's important uh, to think about that, try to understand what those sources of economic vitality are, to put the promise of mining into the context of the, of the larger economy uh, and to see how it fits with the industries that have been the source of most of our uh, job creation over the last two decades. Next one. Whoops, I went the wrong way. Uh, time to start, start winding things up. Uh, I think it's, it's clear if one just looks back at our own history or your own history with mining, that there are costs uh, drawing in projections that are smooth curves showing billions of dollars being added uh, or thousands of jobs being added. Uh, they bear no relationship at all to what the actual history of mining is. That's not the, that the actual history of mining has been terrible. Uh, textile production in New England or uh, slaughterhouses, meat processing uh, in the Chicago area. One, one could name one industry after another uh, that has gone through significant fluctuations. Uh, it's, not, it's not that that's a sign that there's something wrong with mining. Uh, it's just an indication that there's aspects of mining that we have to pay attention to if we want to be uh, go into this with eyes wide open, go into it with a business-like critical look at benefits and costs. There are costs, uh, and we should, uh, without hesitation, try to get an accurate view of that, uh, of that as possible. And I've already talked about the fact that, that mining industry does that. It's only the citizenry. That's what, that's what baffles me. It's only the citizens and decision makers who are told you should only look at the benefits. Meanwhile, the mining companies aren't acting that way. No businessman or businesswoman would act that way. Uh, it's not appropriate for citizens and government decision makers uh, to act in that sort of anti-economic way either. Next. Uh, so I think it's, you know, the message, my message anyways, is clear. We ought to be carefully and critically evaluating uh, the expected monetary consequences, uh, both positive and negative. They're going to be up and down. There's going to be instability. Uh, there's going to be significant disruption within communities. Uh, we should carefully and critically evaluate the non-market environmental consequences. The, the environmental, environmental impacts are economic impacts. They have, and, and I, I not, don't think there's any economist that uh, in this uh, day and age that would deny that. Uh, environmental degradation has measurable impacts on local economic vitality. Uh, in that context, we should consider requiring mitigation measures so that we can try and minimize the costs that the communities might face uh, and try and enhance, if there's public policy uh, tools available, try and enhance the community's share of the wealth that's, that's being created. And then in the end, we have to make an informed judgment about whether the benefits to the community from a public interest point of view justify the remaining unavoidable costs. Uh, there's just one other point I want to make. Uh, 
the standard response to this is that we shouldn't look to the past, that this time will be different. But we're rarely told why this time will be different. Sometimes we're told this time will be different because we have much more strict environmental laws. But many mines developed under those more strict environmental laws failed to meet the standards, the legal standards that were established, and that the mining company, in good faith, I suspect, expected that they would be able to meet. But the history of meeting the standards that were promised at the time the mining began, uh, actually meeting those standards, uh, is a very disturbing one. Uh, so the other side is people say, well, we have a different technology now, suggesting that it's going to be a closed loop, uh, that, that nothing will leave, everything will go into a closed crucible, and uh, things will be carefully treated, so what comes out of that closed crucible is shiny metal and wa pure water uh, or other uh, products that we could use for other purposes. Uh, I think that's a fantasy uh, that no such technology has developed so far, and so we need to look hard and close at the actual mining plan uh, the actual technology that's going to be deployed. And sometimes that's very uh, difficult to do in terms of the timing in which uh, information is released. In any case, this time will be different, I think, as a, a, a collective fantasy. Uh, we should at least remember enough of our history to be skeptical about whether this time will be different and ask uh, for evidence that it's the case. Uh, the other thing, and I've already mentioned that this, uh, the other thing is that we have to look at our economy not as a failing economy. I, often the, the benefits, the promise of mining is presented in a way that more or less says, look, look how your, uh, badly your economy is do, doing. You know, you're on the edge of economic collapse. You know, you're really beggars, you're really economic beggars who really can't afford to be good choosers. Uh, we're making you an offer, as a mining company, we're making you an offer that's too good for you to refuse because it has all these benefits and your economy is gonna crumble without it. The fact is that our economies are not crumbling. We have been through a horrible recession and are barely creeping out of it. But as the previous slide showed, uh, there are powerful economic forces unrelated to mining that are supporting mining counties as well as mining states. And we have to put the promise that's being made to us in the context of uh, that setting where we aren't beggars and we have every right, in fact, every duty to be good choosers. Uh, the attractive, we, there, there's a whole new economy emerging uh, sometimes it's dismissed as a service economy with low wage, low wages, but that service economy, uh, just as in mining, has high paid jobs and low paid jobs. Uh, the attractiveness of communities has become increasingly important uh, to the uh, future econo economic vitality of areas. Next slide. Uh, I think, uh, and I, mentioned this too, so I'll quickly go over it. The, the attractiveness of an area, the ability of an area to attract and hold new people, new businesses, uh, 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 retirees, etc. The attractiveness, and Duluth has been through this and has seen its ability to uh, pull itself back from, from a uh, 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 downward economic slide. Uh, the attractiveness of a community is crucial uh, to the future economic vitality of that community. That makes the uh, environmental amenities, both social, small town, uh, manageable city, uh, attractive urban infrastructure, uh, as well as natural amenities, uh, uh, the, the natural environment itself, makes those an important part of the local economic base. Uh, undermining or threatening them 
undermines or threatens economic vitality. Uh, this doesn't mean that making the choice about mining is easy. Uh, it's not going to be easy. Uh, but one has to, no business decision, no economic decision, no public policy decision is easy. Uh, one has to look for ways to avoid stepping back on the, roller, the economic roller coaster. Uh, one has to try and think beyond the economic meltdown we've just been through and uh, put, put economic vitality and development in a longer uh, run context uh, where ongoing improvement uh, is possible again. Uh, we have to take a look at what's unique to your state, to your county, to your region that would make people want to live there, would make businesses want to come there, would make young people want to stay there as well as make older seniors uh, want to live there. Uh, that involves protecting what you already know you have and is unique uh, across the United States. Uh, and Northeast Minnesota has no shortage of the environmental and social amenities that make it a very attractive place and lay the basis uh, for a very, very vital future economy. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Power. I know you have uh, uh, a limited schedule, but uh, Dr. Power still has about a half hour to be with us today. Uh, you probably saw the news yesterday, by the way. Uh, Minnesota has the fifth fastest growing economy in 2012. And I believe uh, the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area has the second lowest unemployment rate in the United States uh, for, ma uh, for major metropolitan areas. So uh, good news for Minnesota's economy. Uh, I was uh, negligent uh, earlier, ladies and gentlemen, in not uh, recognizing a couple of uh, individuals who we have with us today, decision makers. Uh, Representative Mary Murphy, thank you so much, Representative, for joining us today. And uh, Commissioner Frank Jewell uh, from St. Louis County, and you, thank you. Uh, St. Louis County, within the past year, had a uh, somewhat uh, well-publicized vote on uh, mining uh, and the future of uh, mining in, in uh, St. Louis County. So. Uh, I, I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, here's what I would ask. Uh, if you do represent an organization, just please identify the organization. Uh, and it would be helpful uh, for Dr. Power just to call you by a name if you prefer. So your first name would also be uh, welcome. And I'll try to run the microphone uh, uh, back and forth so we can, uh, everyone can hear. I think you still have uh, a half hour or so, Dr. Power. Okay. Uh, any, uh, so uh, let's open it up for uh, Q&A. Anyone? Did Dr. Power answer all your questions? Okay, sure, let me come to you. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Dr. Powers. My name is Jennifer Cummings. Uh, I'm the editor of the Hillsider Community Newspaper. And I was wondering, um, those graphs about the uh, metal mining employment in Minnesota from 69 uh, to 2011 uh, went down by 78% unemployment. employment. And I'm wondering if the loss or the decline the decline in mining jobs um, has to do with the increased technology of mining, if there's a correlation there. Uh, I think it has to do with both the uh, decline in the uh, value or price of, of iron ore as a part of competition with uh, de other developing countries, uh, uh, etc., and the adoption of new technologies. Typically, what the mining companies do is during uh, those that have some confidence in the future that know that these fluctuations come and go, use downtimes to uh, change uh, the character of the mining process so that when prices rise again, they can go back into production with significantly lower labor costs so that you have a loss of employment and then as a result of the fall in the uh, price of the commodity, then as they hire back, they hire back far fewer workers. And so you, you have sort of a step down uh, 
uh, pattern associated with it. Are you going to pick the people? <laughs> All right, I'm happy to do that, doctor. Thank you. Um, my name is Deanna Erickson. Um, one of the questions that I have, and, and also to step back for a second to that question, um, I can't remember, I'm, I'm going to mess up my citation, but um, one of the mining industry magazines about a year and a half ago put an, out an article of the, about the mine of the future and how it will be completely automated. <laughs> so that was interesting to look at. Um, and they had some demonstration sites in Australia that they were citing. And anyway, um, one of the things I'm wondering is if it's possible to predict the future price of copper. And if so, I mean, I'm sure that there's all kinds of studies on that. If so, what is the direction of the price of copper in the future? I think we saw it's uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of four dollars now, or something. Yeah. Uh, th there's I. I was in the business of projecting commodity prices until the early 1990s. I was on several the advisory committees for several natural gas and electric utilities, and we were always projecting that natural gas prices were going to rise. Uh, and after five years of having it absolutely wrong, all we were doing was moving our graph forward by a year and say, well, it didn't happen this year, it'll happen next year. And finally, I, I had to admit I had no, no idea. Uh, the, the commodity, I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, if you want a really exciting and potentially very well-paid job, you can get into the commodities industry, uh, trading daily, second by second, uh, people betting on whether the, they're going to move up or down. It's it's very volatile. Uh, the the argument for the prices staying high is that the demand of China and India, which didn't previously represent a very substantial demand, uh, uh, both of those economies uh, for a decade or two have been growing substantially, so has Brazil. So we, we have several new actors on, on the economic stage whose population once needs the raw materials to live uh, the way we do. And so some people are projecting prices are going to stay high. Uh, as an economist, uh, working uh, daily with a geologist, uh, I'm just very skeptical of that. Uh, there, there are huge deposits of relatively low grade but economically feasible uh, copper ores uh, to develop. It's not just in the Iron Range or adjacent to the Iron Range. It's not just in in uh, uh, Minnesota. Uh, it's also true in Afghanistan, of all places, uh, and uh, other ex-Soviet uh, republics, as well as uh, Russia itself. So the typical pattern is that when prices begin to rise because demand is exceeding supply, once those prices get high enough and appear that they're going to stay there for a while, all sorts of proposals are developed. That's what happened back in 1974 to 78 in, in Minnesota. And it looked like major copper mining was going to be undertaken, but then the prices tumbled down. That's what's happening now. Uh, those high prices tend to bring on new mines uh, that then put downward pressure uh, on the price. And the result is that the uh, less the more costly mines, the less productive mines, uh, or parts of the mines, are, are then knocked out. I've been dealing with coal and the demand for energy in, uh, in China for, for some time now. And one sees the same old fluctuations. It, the argument was that China is, represents a total change in international coal markets. Uh, and that just hasn't turned out to be true. And a lot of Australian coal producers are very unhappy after having made billions of dollars of investments to find the international price of coal tumbling. So there's, there's the one side of things that a group of people, some geologists, uh, 
almost no economists who talk about the end of coal or the end of copper or the end of cheap natural gas. Uh, they have almost always been proved wrong as that graph of mine uh, 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 indicates. One thing, I should quit at this, <laughs> I'm old enough to remember Earl Butts who was uh, uh, Secretary of Agriculture uh, in the uh, Nixon administration. Uh, any case, in 1973 or 74, the price of wheat uh, got to five dollars. That's before adjusting for inflation, so it'd be like fifteen dollars now or twenty dollars. And he declared a new day has dawned for American agriculture. And you know, within less than a year, agricultural prices were 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 in the dumps, and huge federal payments were having to be made. So I, I think one has to be cautious about. Uh, hanging, make, making a projection that prices are going to stay high or that they're going to exactly uh, mimic what's happened in the past. I think what one can say is that they will be unstable. Uh, that, that, that has almost always been the case, whether we're talking about wheat or corn or beef uh, or natural gas or coal. In our lifetime, well, okay, mine, uh, we've seen what happened in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan when the white pine uh, smelter was shut down and the impact that that had on the uh, Ontonagon and Houghton-Hancock region. Have the copper reserves of the Keweenaw played themselves out? Is there anything left there? Well, there's, there, there's certainly copper. The, the copperwood proposal is... Uh, it's not quite 20 miles away from White Pine, uh, but that, that's a good example. The, the White Pine operation started, I think, in 1950 uh, and uh, largely caved by the middle of the 70s, but then came back into production. Uh, so there was almost a 30-year life for it, but not a 100-year life as in Butte. And the co Copperwood proposal uh, is projected to have a 13-year life. So you can th see things stepping down, but I think that's, that's not because that's the only copper. I mean, there's copper developments across the, uh, proposed copper developments uh, across the Upper Peninsula, especially the western part of it. Thank you, Jen. <coughs> Excuse me, Jen Karen is my name. Thank you for coming to our city on this very special day for all of us, sunshine. We haven't had very much this spring. Um, you mentioned uh, the issue of beggars not being choosy, but they ought to be. And I have a question that's a little tangential to your economics, but it's, it's, it fits and I hope you'll take a stab at it, which is I'm not, a, I think it's a bit axiomatic that a diverse economy is way more sustainable than a mono economy. And what I'm not understanding is why there aren't efforts on the range and in our state legislature to do things to diversify the economy on the range. I've heard, I've heard nothing. Maybe I've missed some things. So would you take a stab at what, what are the social factors that uh, seem to block diversifying? When we lived in Oregon, logging was taking a nosedive and my father was a logger my grandfather was a logger i'm a logger that's what i am well you aren't anymore <laughs> and it, i'm wondering if the same thing is happening here thank you well i i think that the i'm forgetting the name of the organization that is funded by the Minnesota legislature by part of the taxes paid on iron. Yeah, uh, have as one of their principles for a long time been to try and diversify uh, uh, local economies. Now you can ask what, why haven't they been more, more successful? I think there's two aspects to that. Uh, and one of them I hinted at, and that's that uh, a single industry uh, whether it's steel industry, Pittsburgh, or 
uh, a mining industry uh, in the, on the Iron Range or Timber Town uh, in, in Oregon. Uh, a single industry uh, tends to push out other economic activity. Part of the reason for that is things I was, I was talking about, uh, and that's that the, the local economy, timber towns are notoriously unstable. They're like mining towns. They go through long slumps when the housing market is down. Uh, uh, so it's a different cycle, but it's a cycle nonetheless. And so just as you can ask, name, name me a, a prosperous mining town, you can ask, name me a prosperous timber town, and you'll be hard pressed to, for somebody to come up with the name of a place. Uh, so that, that instability, the company town character, tends to discourage entrepreneurs. It, it tends to discourage investment in those communities. It, even, even miners don't want to live in mining towns. Modern miners want to live at some distance to protect the investment uh, they, they make in their home so that if the mine shuts down permanently or temporarily or a huge mess has been made, they don't lose their investment. And the same thing happens with small businesses. So the company town, both mentality and, and cycles tend to discourage uh, investment in the community uh, unless it's investment tied to the, the primary industry. But uh, that's, it, it may appear as though that's what's happening, but in St. Louis County and uh, in my earlier study, uh, I tried to look at St. Louis County, you know, sort of moving Duluth to the side to see uh, what new economic activity was taking place. And it, it was an incredible diversity. Uh, it's hard, given the, the character of the data, to look at particular mining towns to see whether that's crept into there. But St. Louis County was showing incredible economic vitality, uh, separate from Duluth, separate from the Iron Range mining towns. So there is diversity developing. Those uh, 180,000 jobs uh, were not in mining. They weren't exclusively in Duluth. They were in a diverse set of, of industries, mostly including well-paid service industries, whether it's the medical or whether it's, it's uh, uh, high-tech uh, computer services or whether it's in finance. It's in a, a, a broad range. So the diversity uh, is taking place on up through northeastern uh, Minnesota. It may be hard, as it is in, Mon in, in western Montana. Butte, Montana is showing very little diversity. Uh, it's, it's, it's a hard place. The, even the utility executives, the Northwestern Energy, used to be Montana Power Company, has its offices in Butte. But its executives will not live in Butte. They live in Helena uh, because the company office is right on the edge of the pit. And uh, it's, it's not a very dynamic place. So the, there's, there's economic development taking place throughout western Montana. But Butte is struggling uh, uh, very much uh, to remain a, a, a vibrant community without uh, mining and with all of the uh, environmental degradation associated with the past. But there's more. I don't think government agencies nor economic development groups are primarily responsible for the diversification of the economy. They can help. But most of it is people choosing where they want to live and businesses choosing where they want to locate their business. And Minnesota can draw uh, those folks uh, with new ideas for new businesses, new economic activities. It shouldn't have any trouble d doing that given uh, what it has to offer. The city of Duluth, uh, just a second, Dr. Wolf, thank you. Uh, the city of Duluth is engaged in a, a project called 90 by 20, 90,000 people by 2020. And uh, this, it's the mayor and the administration's attempt to diversify the economy. 
Uh, so if we talk about government, and we have state and county officials here, uh, Ron Brochure in, in, uh, in Business North recently uh, pointed out that government has a vested interest in development because of the mineral rights, but government also has regulatory powers. So what do we, as how can we, as actively engaged and interested citizens, be a part of this process to greater extent? What do we do? Well, I, I'm just going to be rep repeating myself, I think. Uh, I think that one, one always gets a better view of economic development strategies if one doesn't start with a particular large project, very particular proposal. Uh, if one starts instead with citizens sitting down with, with opinion makers, leaders, etc., and start talking about why you live here, uh, what is it about that about this place that holds you here, uh, kept you from leaving, or uh, brought you here, uh, as well as what is it that you don't like here? Uh, starting with why people are here, number one, and then number two, having the confidence to say you aren't weird. <laughs> that what brought you here, uh, if protected, and the rest of the world is allowed to know about it, uh, will also bring other people and other businesses here. Uh, that pride of place and protection of place uh, are good places to start, to just have the confidence that we aren't crazy. In Montana, Montana is all, almost always has the lowest paper job in the United States, you know, as a, uh, as, as a state. Uh, and fairly low uh, average income. We also barely have a million people in the entire state, and it's the fourth largest state in terms of geography, uh, which is one of the reasons why our, our, our pay is so low. We all live in relatively small towns. But when the economic statistics are released, saying that, it's, it always seems to have this tone that you folks are really stupid. What are you doing here? You know, your pay is the lowest in the nation. Don't you know where that highway goes? Don't you know where Spokane is or where Seattle is? You can go there and get paid 50% more. Uh, but there's this idea that we must be stupid for living where we are, rather than saying, uh, I wish wages were higher, and I'll work to try and see that wages are higher, but I like what's here. If that's the... If that's the uh, cost of the ticket for me to live here, I'm not a fool. You know, this is where I want to raise my family. This is where I want to live. I like this place, and I'm going to try and make it better. In any case, the, I think one, what one needs and what company towns often don't have are populations that have that confidence, that say, this is a great place, and we're going to make it better. Uh, often in, in company towns, uh, people are too busy fighting each other or fighting with the bosses uh, or just eking out an unstable existence uh, that, that they can't say that. So, you know, I think that's the place to start, is why people are here and why they want to stay here and how to make it better so they can. Thank you for what you've been sharing. I I read in the paper the other day where in the Twin Cities they're going to be tearing down the St. Paul baseball stadium for an amateur team. But what they found is that in 1980 it was the manure dumping for the, for the fairgrounds. So they have to clean up the entire area before they can again rebuild, which they plan on doing. It's a small area. And one of the slides you had right at the end said, how to protect the water resources that are the current and future economic base of northeastern Minnesota. Based on your experience, based on what's been going on around the world, based on the future of economic costs versus these kinds of costs, what has your experience been and what are you feeling about the costs to northeastern Minnesota? 
you mean in terms of the threats? Well, that's, uh, I think that's where you, you can't uh, accept uh, facile assertions that this time will be different. Uh, there, there have been studies of all the environmental impact statements that have done, been done on, on uh, metal mining and processing uh, over, you know, a 40-year period and how well they they projected, not just the company, because most of these EISs are done by independent third parties, how well they projected what the water pollution problems would be and, you know, what actually happened. And it's a very disturbing uh, story, partly because we don't understand acid mine drainage. It's partly a chemical, partly biochemical. Uh, it depends on how air, water, temperature interact. Uh, so in any particular location with any particular mining technology, uh, it's, it's also true that until we start mining the ore, we don't know exactly what the character of the ore and the surrounding rock is either. Uh, so, uh, so one has, I think one has to be cautious uh, especially bringing mining into a new watershed, uh, 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 sulfide copper mining into a new watershed. We don't want to make the mistakes. And, and Missoula, my hometown, has, has made plenty of them. We were going to build a community theater right along the river. Uh, and we discovered it had been the old city dump <laughs> right in downtown. There used to be a... a Oh, what was it called? District heating. They used to burn coal or really, really low go grades, uh, heavy oil to heat water that was then shipped to downtown businesses to provide, provide heat. And probably reduced pollution to a certain extent because everybody didn't have to have their own heating unit. Uh, but all of the waste associated with that was dumped next door in the city dump and right next to the river. So now, I mean, we have this enormous problem. We had a pulp mill operated for 50 years along the Clark Fork River, and it finally shut down, and, and now, I mean, here's the whole bonding or financial assurance problem. The company doesn't exist anymore, and they're, they're discovering that although they weren't polluting the water at the time they were operating, the plume of polluted groundwater is uh, moving directly towards the river, you know, so again one of these things where we thought we had all the protections in place and now we're going to have a huge new Superfund site Right in Missoula, which isn't exactly good for the for the community's uh, Reputation so I I think it's time to be very careful and Know that mistakes get made uh, have financial assurances that have to be put up in real money terms, and reevaluate those, if not every year, every other year, uh, to see if they're still adequate given what, what's been developing. I think it's perfectly reasonable. I, if we don't think of ourselves as beggars, we should sell, think of ourselves as hard-nosed business people who look at costs, benefits, threats, uh, uncertainties, risks, and try to protect ourselves, not 100% protection, but serious protection uh, for our own interests. Uh, Dr. Power, I want to thank you uh, so much. I, I promised that I would uh, get you out of here at a certain time, and, and uh, so I, I really want to thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Thomas Power. <laughs> also, uh, we should thank uh, the Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness uh, who uh, really did an admirable job in putting you in this room together with uh, your great questions and for bringing Dr. Power here. So thanks to the Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness for your great efforts. And finally, thank you for coming today. I invite you one more time to grab some of the materials uh, that are here so that you can add your name to the list of those people who want to be 
actively engaged in these future discussions that will impact the economy of Northeast Minnesota. Thank you so much, and then go out and enjoy.